when I moved into this house in uh, Maple Shade, a house built specifically for me, the one thing missing in this marvelous house, which I love, it was a doorbell that just went ding dong. And I said, no, got to do something special. So, um, yes, I have a doorbell that uh, plays part of Frank. It plays dooby dooby doo. In fact, why don't we listen to it? Stephen racing to the door, finger poised. Yes. Well, had to be. Some friends of mine, Betty Bradley, Nora McDermott, and uh, Stella Sotolano and Ruth Perver, we had um, taken over somebody's club, you know, and um, uh, put out bulletins every three months, I think. I might show you some in the closet. And, um, they didn't invite us to this dinner that they had with Frank in New York. And they said, because we, we were like, a, mm, there were five of us that ran the club. And the girl up there, I since can't remember her name. And uh, she didn't want us to come because she said it was for presidents only, it was supposed to be one girl. So we got ticked off at that. And um, uh, I was saying to the girls, you know, I said, we should, we're presidents and we should have, we put out a club, we put out a bulletin and everything. Love and I said, it. we should be able to meet him. So I got in touch with Palumbo, Frank Palumbo, God bless his heart and soul. And um, we, we told him what we wanted. And he was kind of excited about it. And he said, if, um, if you can arrange it, he said, I'll pay for the whole thing. Each girl was allowed to bring a guest. So I brought my mother. Betty Bradley, I think. I don't think she could choose between her sisters, so I don't think she brought anybody. Uh, Ruth brought somebody, her sister, and Stella brought um, a friend of hers, and she made the cake, and she, you know, was able to come. And um, the Perry Charles says, you know, well, you just, Frank came, was to come in, and they said, you just come up, you know, introduce all the girls. I said, I can't introduce all the girls. I said, I can, I'll be lucky if I can remember my own name. And, uh, I tell you, when he said, um, do you want to see pictures of my children? He takes out this great big wallet when you know, one of those things with a whole bunch of pictures. And he was so, so proud of showing us those pictures. When I met Mr. Sinatra, I gave him a present. And when I met Mr. Sinatra, I was trying to figure out, you know, well, first of all, I didn't know how I was going to meet him. And the only way that I thought that I could meet him was to give him something. Not that Frank is looking for anything from any of us, aside from the love and the admiration and the adoration that he deserves. And I'd written, copied actually a book into Braille, which included his song titles from 1939 through 1952. And I'll always be indebted to Betty Brown because Betty lent me the book that was inside the man and his music that I copied and made the Braille book from. Okay, and I, and I wrote this book and I wanted to keep it for myself. And I said, geez, if I ever meet Frank, what am I gonna give him, a shirt, cologne? And I gave him the book and he was thrilled with it. So when I met Mr. Sinatra, his reaction was very warm. That book is for you, Mr. Sinatra. Oh, it's for me. Boy, that's, that's awful nice of you to do that. Six months to do it. That's awful nice of you to do that. And You're a good man. You're the greatest. And I don't <laughs> care what the press says about you. Oh, we don't worry about those cats. And that was, that was basically the gist of the interview. It was, um, it was a very warm interview. It lasted all of about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, the reason why you heard a break there was because true I did have my machine under my coat okay and I had my machine under my coat but I just wasn't going to walk in and start taping and I really had a problem uh, asking him getting up enough nerve to ask him if I could record and he said sure go ahead put your tape on put your thing on it was wonderful um, I liked the way he walked, I liked the way he smelled. Everything was just 
it was there. And when I met him, I'm sure he had to change his shirt because I, I just burst into tears all over his tuxedo shirt. What does he look like? It's gorgeous. <laughs> he's, he's tall, slim. He was at that time, because he's put on a little bit of weight now. But uh, bluest eyes we ever saw, brown hair, nice big ears, beautiful mouth, and we even liked the scar that he had. And I think you, you'll notice a mole on his nose. Yeah, they were all, they were all turn-ons, I guess you'd call it. <laughs> Uh, he looks like a lot of different things to me. Um, I remember uh, a, a, a Saturday afternoon at the Waldorf Astoria in New York where they have a, a residence. And I was waiting to do an interview. And uh, it was just one of those things. First, you hear the voice, and you know he's in the building. And you'll hear he'll, something nice will happen, and you'll hear somebody say, oh, yes, that's marvelous. You know, marvelous? It's got to be Frankie's next door. And I walked in, and I saw Frank Sinatra, who I'm six foot four. Frank's about 5'10", five, 5'11". I don't know, he just looked like a giant that day. I mean, he really, it was shortly after his surgery, he looked so well, he looked so rested, he looked so tan, he looked so human, he looked so nice. Well, I haven't seen him in so long. He was uh, slight, he wasn't as skinny as he was in the beginning, but he was slight. Uh, he was my height, as I can see from a photo of the two of us standing beside each other, which is 5'8". Um, he looks taller because he's thinner. Um, he's got incredibly blue eyes, a very warm and engaging smile. And the times that I've met him, he's been very sociable. What do I think Frank looks like? Well, he's got to look very sure of himself. You know, we all go through periods of time when we're not sure of ourselves. But Mr. Sinatra has to look very sure of himself. He's a very clean-looking man, although when I met him, I was very surprised. And Mr. Sinatra, if you ever hear this interview, please don't be angry with me. When I shook his hands, this was in 75. Now, it could be from his operation that he had on his hand in 71. When I met him in 75, his hands were very rough. He has very small hands, but they were very rough. And I looked at him, and I was going to say to him, geez, did you park your truck okay? 